Thanks. Uh, see, the, the guy up here. There goes some more money. That's okay. It goes to a good cause. Thank you. Our next speaker is Judge Richard Carter. Uh, I know Judge Carter from Crime Stoppers. Probably went when I started in Crime Stoppers in Peoria in 1982. So Judge Thursday. Carter and I. It was a Thursday. It was a Thursday too. Thank you. Uh, we go back a long ways. I I can now call Judge Carter a good friend as well. Uh, judge Carter, uh, as, as it says, is a retired judge from Texas. He served as a director of, uh, and as a director of legal advisor for Crime Stoppers USA, as a director, secretary, general counsel, and executive director for Crime Stoppers International, as a director of legal services for Crime Stoppers United States of America, and as a two-term chair of the Texas Advisory Council. Uh, Richard Carter practices law, performs music writes books, represents professional baseball players, and has spoken as Crime Stoppers topics for only four decades during the most recent two centuries. Okay, you'll think about that for a while. <laughs> uh, Richard is a, is a baseball nut just like I am, and uh, if you get him going on, on that or his singing career, uh, you won't get him stopping talking for a long time. But I present to you Richard Carter. Thank you very much. I'd like to start off by saying this is an awesome microphone. Usually I don't have this much omnidirection and uh, I don't know what's happening. It's great. Uh, uh, but if we have some, uh, another uh, carpet bombing uh, from upstairs, well, somebody will help me and run up there. Uh, it, it's an honor to talk to crime stoppers. I used to try to keep track of how many people I spoke to so that I could be like, McDonald signs and say something like over two million spoken to or uh, but then they might say 20% of which were awake and you know I didn't want to get into all the classifications of how you or do you count somebody if you talk to them once do you get to count them again if they're at the next conference because a lot of times it was the same people but the reality is there's a lot of crime stoppers uh, people that come and go there's some constants and we love and appreciate that but there's always new people coming in and I think it's important especially when I have a topic such as crime stoppers 101 to condense 30 something years of crime stoppers uh, procedures and advice and so forth into uh, for an hour and 15 minutes or approximately time it is a challenge and so uh, we, we may uh, we may we may get a hundred we may get 89 percent but I'll try to uh, hit as much as I can to share with you and I think it's important to remember that there may be some people in this room that uh, we've recruited them we brought them into crime stoppers and we never really uh, you know we were already running and we didn't have a chance to get them back at the starting line and tell them what it was all about or give them the orientation or indoctrination or we thought we'd do it sort of like a roll call training in law enforcement where each time we get together we just talk about a little bit here an aspect there an aspect here and and hope that they collectively gather all of the information that they need to know to participate and do the job effectively. And um, I, I do think it's also a great thing that they put on your thumb drive uh, the uh, uh, what I refer to as the Crime Stoppers Super CD content and I update that periodically. And I was amazed that it actually fit on the one gig because it's a lot of stuff. One, one day we printed out all of the stuff that I collected. Some of it I wrote, some of it other people wrote, PowerPoints, all these different things. We tried to print it out and if you print it out it comes, let me see the pain level if that works, right there. It From the floor to about right there if you try to print out what all is on that Crime Stoppers collection and it's under different folders and, and the uh, key document that I would direct your attention to if we were trying to uh, replicate the Crime Stoppers 101 curricula would actually be uh, the, 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 there would be one that I think the folder as we put it in there was something like basic Crime Stoppers and in there there's a nothing more than an outline just to go by that was put together a little bit by me but mostly by our Crime Stoppers founder uh, 
former homicide detective Greg McAleese of the uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico Police Department. And so that means a lot when you see it from his perspective, what he thought was important to communicate to people in, in a basic Crime Stoppers course. So you'll you'll find that outline there, and I would suggest you may want to go go to it. There are other things that are on there. Uh, the the materials on that uh, electronic format are, are put into file folders such as uh, board members or our coordinators, media. Then by topic such as rewards, things not to do, and we'll talk about those uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, but but you'll you'll find that there are things that uh, will direct specific duties such as uh, taxes or treasurer. So you'll find there, and, and some of the items may be in more than one folder, but they'll be helpful to you as indexed. And and uh, a lot of times people don't realize what they have when they have that that mass of information. Uh, it, it's virtually a uh, an Encyclopedia Britannica type of a collection of everything you would ever want to know about Crime Stoppers. And we periodically update that. If, if I find something, I add it to the master on a daily basis and then annually I help distribute that. So I, I supplement that so that if there's a topic that I cannot give in-depth coverage to during the time that we have here this morning, you will know that the answers are there and that are, are available for you, including a lot of forms and documents, contracts, PowerPoints for training, uh, th things such as this on all the different topics. But what I'd like to do is, uh, and, and, and I wrote some notes here, uh, random thoughts before I get into the, to the, uh, the heart of the Crime Stoppers 101. <laughs> I noticed that there there are some items that they have in the uh, uh, the, the silent auction or the maybe it's a loud auction. It seemed like I was drinking and I was loud when we bid for these things. So maybe it's not a silent auction, but uh, I, I'm going to recommend that if the Ted Williams item goes pretty well, that next year uh, you can actually make a lot of money and, and, and save a lot by going with the, uh, I'll, it's somewhat of a oxymoron, but I'll call it the Ted Williams bobblehead because they don't cost as much for the Ted Williams version because they don't have the head with it. Uh, for those of you who follow, know that that's cryogenically frozen and, and stored by some of the family members, I believe. So so if you get the Ted Williams bobblehead, it doesn't cost as much. There's not as much manufacturing, not as many licensing fees since the face and it, features aren't there. But anyway, something to think about. The other thing, if, if there was a reference to something going on in the Red Wolf Room. Please be careful not to confuse the Red Wolf Room with the Red Fox Room, because the Red Fox Room is not children friendly and it's X-rated uh, after the uh, late comedian. Uh, the last thing that I would say is uh, uh, Crime Stoppers has the name Crime Stoppers, and I'll tell you a little bit about the history of that in a moment. But uh, a lot of people always wonder why we, you know, why, why aren't we crime solvers like they are in, in the Northeast? Their our program is known as Crime Solvers, which might be more accurate, more correct than Crime Stoppers. But but uh, I was just thinking uh, of, of changing one thing if we. If we changed Crime Stoppers, what, what, I think it would just be one letter in it if we removed the O in Crime Stoppers and, and made that an I. In other words, instead of having an I for an I, we have an I for an O, then uh, don't try to follow that. But uh, the, it would, I guess, be Crime Tippers. And, and that, yeah, that could almost describe what, what we do or deal with. Uh, the people who uh, give us tips so, so it couldn't be crime tippers, but something to think about. Here's where we got the name Crime Stoppers. We had an agreement with Chester Gould, the, uh, the, the late uh, artist and uh, uh, person who created the Dick Tracy comic strip. And each Sunday they would have a certain panel when the, when the, when the comic strip was in color. Uh, and it was the Crime Stoppers textbook where they would have some sort of a crime solving or crime stopping or crime prevention tip that was featured. 
And when Crime Stoppers got started, it didn't have a name. And so our founder, Greg McAleese, got permission from Chester Gould, the creator of Dick Tracy comic strip, uh, and, uh, who is operating out of uh, Il Illinois, uh, and also of the Chicago uh, Times, I need to say Times, not Crime Syndicate, the Chicago Times Syndicate that, that published that to have the right to use the word Crime Stoppers, provided that we broke it up into two words, because uh, Dick Tracy uh, comic strip use it as one word, Crime Stoppers, and I know there may be some people who have some Crime Stoppers that are all one word, and they, they've not really uh, given us a hard time over breaking our agreement with them, but as you know, sometimes you send things to the printers uh, or it gets squished in to make it fit on the card or the, 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 the thing that you're publishing, so it, it happens. But uh, irrespective of that, we have developed quite a name for Crime Stoppers. As a matter of fact, a lot of people have tried to uh, rip us off a little bit. And, uh, uh, for example, there's a cleaning company that calls themselves Grime Stoppers. And then there will be a few people who even uh, try to use the name for something else uh, to, to, to try to make money in a commercial manner, such as the Crime Stopper burglar alarm or car alarm. So we, we've had to fight our battles over the year, but our founder actually could have done a better job of protecting the name Crime Stoppers, but we did have certain limitations such as the agreement with uh, Chester uh, Gould and, and the Dick Tracy and the, the Chicago Syndicate. Uh, additionally, Greg McAleese wanted the Crime Stoppers name to be available to be used in any and every community that took up the Crime Stoppers program. And so uh, that, that's why you sometimes wonder why there's not been a better job of protecting the name, at least in the United States. Crime Stoppers began in 1976 in Albuquerque, New Mexico with one case. The first case that was uh, uh, advertised was through what we refer to as a reenactment. It was very primitive. Uh, and I won't go into all the details of it, but uh, it, it, at that time it was just the last ditch effort to solve a cold case, if you will. And uh, it worked. As a matter of fact, before it solved that case, it solved two or three others where people said, well, I don't know, I don't know the information that you're looking for in this case, but I've got some other information about another crime and uh, solved the sexual assault case before it ever solved the murder case that was featured. So these Crime Stoppers reenactments became known uh, as the crime of the week. And Crime Stoppers initially was primarily on television. And then we learned that it would be, it was so effective that it could work in other media markets. And uh, so we, we expanded into uh, the print media, the electronic media, radio and television. and and so forth. And there'll be a theme that I'll talk about during here, uh, during this presentation about how technology has changed our Crime Stoppers operations, primarily for the better, that, that's good. But, but what it was, was the citizens uh, in Albuquerque wanted to assist law enforcement. Law enforcement could not afford the additional budget item of funding the publicity that it needed to advertise about unsolved crimes and the need for information to be provided to law enforcement. They didn't have the money to pay for uh, whether you want to call them snitch funds or uh, uh, informant uh, payments. Uh, they didn't have the money. They were doing good to have some money uh, appropriated by the uh, uh, municipality of Albuquerque. Uh, and and as, as we all know, especially those that are in law enforcement, uh, law enforcement officers uh, used to and perhaps occasionally still uh, pay informants out of their own hard-earned hard money, paying out of their back pocket. Uh, may not be a whole lot of money, uh, but, but, but it, it, it was done. And so Crime Stoppers was the citizens coming together and saying, what can we do to help law enforcement? And it was a partnership between the citizens of the community, law enforcement, and the media. In fact, it was such a partnership that, that if you divided up the tasks, the duties, the responsibilities, the expertise, it was really pretty equally shared, uh, almost like uh, uh, lawyers uh, may not know math, but they, they know how to 
dividing fees and get their 33 and a third percent. Well, it was almost like the 33 and a third percent uh, input and responsibilities by the citizens, the media, and law enforcement. And so early on, Greg McAleese and others referred to Crime Stoppers as operating like a three-legged stool, that it was supported by the three legs. And the other aspect of it that anyone who's ever sat on a three-legged stool knows that if one of the legs is off or not, pull, not, not the right length or not pulling its weight, or if it's missing, then that stool is not going to work. It's not going to support you. You're going to fall over. So, so there's, there's no united we sit if one of the legs uh, falls. So uh, that was the partnership that we had. Uh, Crime Stoppers began in Albuquerque. It spread to a few other programs in, uh, in, in uh, New Mexico. Then it jumped state lines, went over to El Paso. I, I think my taser is going off. Do you hear the click? No, okay. All right, no. Okay. I love live presentations. But it, it might not be my taser because I, I didn't really hear the click. I just felt the 50,000 volts. But hey. This is an electrifying event for me, I want you to know, and uh, hopefully for you too. But, but uh, Crime Stoppers did spread. It jumped over the state line, went into El Paso. It jumped uh, several states over, went uh, to Orlando, uh, Florida. And the first international program was in Calgary, Canada, and, and quickly followed by others. But it just spread wonderfully. Everybody thought initially that Crime Stoppers was a television show because of the uh, emphasis on the weekly reenactments. And uh, the, the enactment, reenactments got more and more sophisticated to where the television stations started competing for awards. Uh, as to how realistic they were. In fact, we went so far that we had to go back and remove some of the uh, fake blood and other things that were a little too graphic or, or too frightening. Uh, and there was always the, the stand-up police officer or, or spokesperson. And uh, people would uh, wonder, you know, how long they could keep this up because it was quite expensive to do weekly reenactments. Uh, so, so things have changed over the years to where now it's more like a spot, a, a Crime Stoppers uh, a public service announcement or so forth. So there's different ways of doing it. And as I said, we learned that there might be a, a community that uh, wanted Crime Stoppers and you didn't have to be a large, you didn't have to be a, a community that was so large that you had your own TV station or radio. There, there was a program that started a Crime Stoppers organization that, that all they had was a bulletin board on the mom and pop grocery store, which was the only business in the entire community. And they would put up there the crime that had happened and what it was, you know, which John Deere tractor had the, had the tires slashed or what, whatever what it might have been the crime that was of interest to them. And uh, then they would offer the reward. The, uh, the, the method of payment. Uh, originally started with the payment at a dry cleaners at Arnie Olson's dry cleaners uh, establishment in uh, Albuquerque. Today it, it's gone to where it's uh, almost universal where people try to use a uh, uh, drive through uh, uh, cashiers or tellers at banks. That's the most common. There may be others, other methods of, of uh, communi communicating uh, uh, and uh, delivering the rewards. But the, uh, the, the program was so successful that uh, there became a need for uh, promulgating this and, and, and expanding the, uh, you know what, it could be that, you think some of my telephones could be yeah. causing this? Let me see, I mean, I'll, I'll turn that one off. <laughs> turn that one off. And I don't have time to turn them all off, but that's the, those are the main ones. Uh, I've got like a, a, you know, I know the officers have uh, guns, backup guns strapped to their ankles. I have telephones, I'm sorry. So, but those are further away from the mic and they're probably okay. But uh, I digress, literally and figuratively. The, uh, the Crime Stoppers uh, program became so successful that they created a state Crime Stoppers Commission in New Mexico quickly followed by the Texas Crime Stoppers Advisory Council, which is now the Texas Crime Stoppers Council. So it sounds like they have more power than when they were just advisory. So it was a, it was a, it was a big deal. Uh, there are a lot of other states that have state-created uh, commissions or councils 
which are primarily charged with the duty of helping spread the Crime Stoppers program, how to create more, train them, make them more efficient. And many of those statutes have protection, which add a, uh, an added layer of uh, protection for Crime Stoppers and enhances the informer's privilege in that particular jurisdiction uh, that they may have through case law will they codify that with, with the statutes. Uh, as we've grown, we've seen that the Crime Stoppers uh, uh, program has been accepted in state and federal courts, and we have a very, very high rate of success. Uh, something like 96% of the Crime Stoppers cases result uh, in, in arrest and convictions. And of those that might be appealed, uh, we win nearly all of those, and those that are lost are normally not lost on a Crime Stoppers issue, but on some uh, perceived or actual misconduct or inappropriate action, either of law enforcement, the judge, or uh, perhaps of the, the attorneys that were involved in the case. So there's plenty of blame to go around and finger pointing anytime any kind of case is lost. And, and uh, what we try to do is make, make sure that uh, any of the cases that are lost or reversed on appeal are not on the basis of something that the Crime Stoppers organization or the Crime Stoppers program was a part of. And that's why we try to teach, if, if you will, the best practices that we're uh, we're aware of. I'm not the smartest person in the world about Crime Stoppers. I do try to keep my memory fresh uh, and, and all, all I do is I collect the success stories and the failures and I try to use both of those categories when I convey to people what I think they should or should not do or I share with them what has worked with some Crime Stoppers programs and what has not worked. So uh, it, it's, it's more like a bulletin board where I can let you read and see uh, what, what happens. But the, uh, the, the Crime Stoppers concept is, is absolutely fabulous. I, I know I'm preaching in the choir here, but I tell people that I believe that Crime Stoppers is just as important a, a, an event in, in criminal justice in the United States and the world as certain other things that we normally look at as landmarks, such as uh, fingerprints, such as mobile radios for police. I won't talk about air conditioning, that's important in the South and sometimes in the summer, but, but in the crime solution aspect of it, and DNA, the, the, uh, and, the, and then later on the fingerprints, the APHIS or the automated fingerprint identification systems and so forth. I truly believe that the Crime Stoppers concept is just as important as all of those others and that we should realize that. The, uh, uh, the, the program uh, just, it, it's pretty unique and it's difficult sometimes to describe what Crime Stoppers is. I, had one situation where I was reviewing the testimony in a case where a, a police lieutenant who was uh, a, a supervisor in the department, <clears throat> not in Crime Stoppers, uh, but it's a little bit like Scott was saying, just because you're in law enforcement, don't assume that you know everything there is about Crime Stoppers. And this poor lieutenant was on the stand in a case that was solved by Crime Stoppers, and a criminal defense attorney asked him to describe what Crime Stoppers is, and he said, well, uh, They've got a car with a logo on it. They've got a number. They've got a little office down in the basement at the police department. And I think they come in once a month and uh, have a little snack and a meeting in our, <laughs> using our police department and didn't know much more about it. And he was trying to think of everything he knew, and that was all he knew about it. So I do think it's important that we spread the word, not assume that everybody knows what, what Crime Stoppers is. But I think it's a perfect formula because it, 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 if you look at what is happening today, there are some people that don't think they need a, a traditional Crime Stoppers organization. They think that all they need is some computer software uh, uh, and, and uh, funding to, 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 to purchase that or to use it. And that is a good thing to do in managing Crime Stoppers uh, type programs or reward programs. However, they're, they're, we need to remember the importance of the people 
Do you remember when you used to call a business or a company and there were things called human beings that would answer the phone instead of talking to a machine and having to press? There's some things that work well, sometimes there's others. Well, well, here, here's the thing. Uh, even the people that work with Crime Stoppers are often leaders of the community. They're the people who care. And for the police department, the sheriff's department, the state police, the county, the federal authorities, to have real people that care. And, and where it's not their job, they're volunteers to care about the safety in the community. That, that's something far beyond the money that you raise or contribute or have made available for Crime Stoppers operations and rewards. You can't buy that. And I think if I were a chief of police or a sheriff or the head of a law enforcement agency, I would want a, a real living Crime Stoppers board to be there to help me with issues, especially the crime rates and the solution of those crimes in the community. And, and I think that's sometimes what, if we're not looking, if we're not listening, we may not know that, that they're, they're not giving you credit, they're not assessing your value uh, as, as they should if they think that they don't need you. With that having been said, it's also a thing that uh, in, in housekeeping where I sometimes remind the local boards I once said that I learned from Aristotle, and so I said, damn, you're old. <laughs> but uh, Socrates and I were talking with Aristotle. Anyway, he was telling that, uh, maybe it was a book I read by Aristotle, that politics exist at every level of anything involving humans. And it involves, uh, it, it, it's, it's present in, in Crime Stoppers boards too. So what I, I caution people about is try to resolve your, your differences civilly and I don't mean in civil court, uh, try, try to uh, uh, work through your issues. Everybody's got different opinions and they aren't always you know, going to be the same or, or unanimous. Uh, but because what we have is sometimes boards start fighting among themselves and it, and it comes to the attention of the, the, the law enforcement chief and, and they, they, they might get to the point where they say, I don't know if I can deal with this group anymore. And, and we don't want to, to have them reject the Crime Stoppers concept and program because they don't like or don't understand or can't tolerate some of the conflicts that sometimes arise in a Crime Stoppers board. And believe me, I, I get a lot of legal questions about Crime Stoppers, but I probably get twice that many about resolving conflicts on a local board or, or and, and sometimes a state board, a national and international board. It, it seems like it's always there. So try to remember that, that the program is, is bigger than just us or who, who we might be. Uh, I, I learned uh, the it's not about me uh, lesson very early in life at the age of I think five or six I don't remember because I couldn't count at that time but uh, I was at a birthday party uh, a kid in the neighborhood we all sat down the, the presents were there he starts opening the presents and so do I and then his mother explained to me that it was my friend's birthday not mine it wasn't about me so I learned there that sometimes that's a good maxim to go back to and just just not take things too personally and remember that it's not necessarily about you, it's for the greater good and the success of the program. But Crime Stoppers is a perfect organization because we're so complex. It is admittedly hard to explain on the witness stand what it is or how it works. Sometimes you, you need a, a, a board or a marker pen or projector to show the organizational chart and the three legs and how everything works. But, but if you think about it, you got the law enforcement, they know what to do with the information. They understand reasonable suspicion. They understand, uh, they understand probable cause. They understand in the courts the proof beyond a reasonable doubt. They understand what is needed to make a case. The media knows how to get the publicity out there. They know how to get the attention of people, whether it's the print media, the electronic, uh, the, the social media, everything that, that, that's uh, changing to, to uh, expand our abilities to reach people. The media knows how to do that. Well, the, the board, your leaders in your community, you know what's, you know what's good for your community. You know. But you take the pulse of your neighbors. You know how they feel about 
the degree of uh, the comfort or, or fear that they have to walk the streets or do business or to be in your community. One of the things uh, when people are trying to decide whether or not to have a Crime Stoppers program or not is whether or not they want to admit that there's crime in their community. When we talk about crime in the schools, some school systems say, we don't want Crime Stoppers, we don't have a crime problem here, I'm a good principal, I'm a good superintendent, I don't need your help. Crime? There's no crime. That was just two kids scuffling with that knife the other day in the hallway. <laughs> just a few stitches, a few ounces of blood lost, I mean, they'll get over it, they're just growing up. Well, forget it, we know that Crime Stoppers has a place in the school too to save lives and protect property and protect teachers and students and visitors. Well, we had some chambers of commerce who said we, we don't want to admit we have crime in our community, we don't want a crime science program. Well, we have finally convinced, I think, pretty much 100% of them that you would rather people, when they're trying to decide to move to your community or not, know that there's a Crime Stoppers program there so that if crime erupts uh, or shows its ugly head in, in your community, there's already a system in place to receive the information uh, to solve that case. And there's already reward money out to go out to the person who anonymously reports the, the crime stop solving information. And you would rather have that than none. Because if I were a criminal and I was going down the highway, sound like a song now, I could, but that's the first line of it. Well, uh, I'd probably keep on going down the road uh, past the, the, the community that had the billboard that said they had Crime Stoppers because that, that means that my job is tougher there and, and uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to be as successful there. I want to find a place to practice my crime where they don't think crime exists, they don't talk about it, they stick their heads in the sand, and they've got no Crime Stoppers uh, website, they've got no Crime Stoppers hotline, uh, they've got no clue. <laughs> and, and, and that's doubly, the, the, they, they will not have a clue because they don't have a way of uh, getting it from people who uh, uh, can use Crime Stoppers. So uh, the other thing that, that we had to overcome was People thought that their, their FBI UCR crime rate would increase if people reported more crimes or people uh, put in information and there were more crimes that were solved. And I say, maybe so initially, maybe, maybe not. But what's more important, knowing about crimes and solving them and preventing it? Uh, or, or having a, having a low, low uh, reporting rate to the FBI? Uh, I'd rather live in the real world and fix the problem than, than try to make people think that they're safe when they're not. Uh, the, uh, the, the Crime Stoppers program, when you're trying to look at how it operates, um, we, I, we think in terms of crime solution because we get the tips, but the other aspect of it is I think we also prevent crime. Uh, we do it in several ways. So, uh, and some of our Crime Stoppers coordinators in law enforcement have more than one duty. One of the duties may be the Crime Stoppers coordinator. They all, all also may uh, uh, put, put on the hot, sweaty, and stinky McGruff uh, uniform and head and be involved in uh, education and crime prevention. But, but I think there's, there's nothing nasty about the word or phrase crime prevention if you're a Crime Stoppers uh, participant because we, we help prevent crime too. If nothing else, let's look at it uh, in this simplistic way. If Crime Stoppers solves a case, gets the person before a court where they're convicted, incarcerated, warehoused for however long, uh, if justice is done, then that person will at least for the time being not be able to commit other crimes in your community. Uh, yes, they might be able to, to rape each other and stab each other and all these nasty things uh, that, they, that do happen occasionally in, in, uh, in, in jails and prisons, but at least it's not going to be happening out there where, where you are and your family are. So it stops crime that way. The other way is it sends a message to would-be criminals. They might say, you know, I'm aware that Bubba got caught on the uh, Crime Stoppers tip and makes it tougher to commit crimes in the community. So I'm, I'm going to reform a little bit. 
I used to commit 10 bur burglaries of, of uh, habitations a month. I'm going to cut down to just one or two because because I don't want to I don't want to roll the dice that many times. That is preventing crime. Another thing that it does is it creates public awareness which can result in fewer crimes. For example, if you publicize that someone was at an ATM and they got their money, they got it at 2 a.m. in the morning, uh, they've been drinking, uh, they, they're they not in the best condition to be vigilant, they're more vulnerable as a victim, and, and you talk about the facts of the case without saying who it was or embarrassing them. Well, people who hear that, that uh, that plea for information to solve that crime are going to say, and if you'll excuse my expression, especially those of you on the internet, I'm just talking about animals on the farm, they're going to say, what a dumbass. <laughs> well, well, you know, they're going to say, I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have uh, uh, d done the, uh, uh, the flashing of the money. That, well, you're educating people as to how maybe they can avoid becoming a, a, a good target for, for a criminal's action. So yet another indirect way of preventing or reducing crime. So those are some of the things I like people to think about, about the effects of, of Crime Stoppers, what we can do. The, uh, the mechanics of, 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 of how the Crime Stoppers program operates. Originally, we offered rewards only for felony crimes, and they were primarily focused on crimes against the person. Uh, because those were the most shocking crimes uh, as opposed to uh, crimes, even felonies, where it was uh, uh, crimes against property. We then, of course, realized that uh, the, the war against drugs uh, was something where uh, it, it had such, a, uh, such an effect and impact on crime that, that uh, those, those crimes needed to be featured. But the, the local board primarily focused on felonies. To this day, they primarily focus on felonies. There's nothing, unless it's in your bylaws or your corporate charter, that prevents you from offering rewards. Did I lose the battery? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Woo. Wow, maybe it was trying to tell me something. Uh, we have like a, a, a safety battery pack or something. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll try to get through this anyway. The, the reason why we focused on felony offenses is that we did not want to overwhelm whoever received the Crime Stoppers tips. For example, if we open it up to all felonies, people might be calling in about overdue library books or littering or signs uh, tacked onto a, a utility pole and, and the Crime Stoppers coordinator, the people that worked at it, just going to say, uh, take this job and shove it. I, 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 I can't focus on my homicides or, or my felony cases. Uh, and, and also the board might say, we can't exist if we pay out all of these rewards on misdemeanors that we're getting hit with. Or we'll have people calling in, Bubba made a right turn without signaling. Isn't that a crime? <laughs> and you say you pay money, your rewards on tips and solve. Uh, crimes and you don't limit it to misdemeanors or felonies. So that's the historical reason why we tried. It's not that we don't care about it. There may be some situations where a first offense, DUI or driving under the influence or, or DWI, uh, driving uh, while intoxicated, those, those uh, acronyms are, are used differently in different jurisdictions. But it may be that the first offense is a misdemeanor and it's not a felony. Well, the first First timer can just as easily, you know, become somebody involved in a vehicular homicide. So, so I, I don't want to say that you can't or shouldn't offer money uh, for, for cases like that that may technically start off as being a misdemeanor. But your board decides what crimes it pays rewards for. Your board decides what amount is the appropriate amount of, of the reward. The uh, uh, Thumb drive that you have has some articles in there that I wrote about rewards, and one is about large rewards. I don't have time to go into that now, but I just say you, you, you can't give away money uh, forever. Uh, it, it, it's uh, not like uh, giving away paper. Your paper you can give away, I guess, if you want to, 
because uh, if the paper is like it grew on trees, I think actually it, it really was grown on trees. But, but the money is a little different. We have to print that and account for it. Uh, the, uh, the size of the award is appropriate. In that, in that article, I suggest that you not go crazy and do things like uh, we'll have people offer $40,000 for a, uh, a, a person who mistreated a dog. Now, I, I love dogs too, but uh, I think $40,000 could have solved a lot of uh, murders of uh, people, uh, uh, human beings. Thank you very much. I feel refreshed. Now I feel caffeinated. Okay. The, uh, so you, do, you make those decisions. You run your local board. You make the right decisions. The, uh, uh, the, the groups beyond the local board may give you guidance, uh, such as when I try to give guidance on the size of the rewards uh, that can help cut down on the number of problems. But the board has a very important function. The, uh, uh, the, the, and, and we look at other duties and responsibilities. The, the law enforcement coordinator or the law enforcement side of it, uh, they, they have a lot of duties. And I think it's important for the three elements, uh, the, the law enforcement, uh, the, the, the citizens that serve on your board, and, and the media to each understand the roles and the responsibilities. That's why I think that you, you uh, make access to training manuals or operation manuals that are more in electronic form now than print, that you learn things at uh, seminars so that you better understand what people can do and what they can't. For example, if we're not careful, we will have Crime Stoppers boards of civilian vol citizen volunteers that try to put a duty on the on the law enforcement officer that's really not fair. In fact, in some cases, it may be that it's 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 not even uh, proper and that it's misconduct. For example, some states have uh, state statutes that prohibit law enforcement officers from raising money or for you know dragging the bag or whatever under certain conditions because if you go there with your badge, your gun, and uniform, people are going to be reluctant not to give you money if you solicit money uh, from them because they're afraid that if you say no or you don't give enough, that if you ever stop them on traffic, they're, they're, they're toast. They're not going to get that, that rare warning ticket or the, well, go on down the road. I, you know, be careful next time. They, they think they're going to get, so for all those reasons, many states have statutes. The other part, most if not all law enforcement agencies have general orders which have a code of conduct that will say what you can and cannot do, and one of those things may involve uh, soliciting money. So it's really not the job of the, the peace officer, the law enforcement officer, to raise the funds for the 501c3 charitable organization Crime Stoppers. And I do recommend that you be a 501c3 organization so that you can avail yourself of all the tax benefits, including uh, the provision that makes it where you do not have to report under a 1099 uh, to the IRS the amount of money that you pay, even if it is more than six uh, $599.99 in one payment or in one tax year, you're exempt of, from reporting that, which obviously uh, enhances the promise of anonymity because you can't promise anonymity and then say, oh, I, I need your Social Security <laughs> number or tax ID uh, and your name because I have to send this telling the IRS that you got this. doesn't make them free from paying taxes still between them and the IRS if they have, have enough income to report. But the good part is our conscience is, conscience is clean because we're not violating a, a federal treasury regulation or the Internal Revenue Code. We're not committing a federal civil and criminal uh, violation, uh, and, and, and we're protecting our, our informant under our promise that we made them. So so we, we recommend that you, you, you be an organization in, in that format of 5013, but, but uh, the police are not generally, typically, we don't recommend that they be voting members. We can go in and we can talk about that later. But, we relieve them of the responsibility because the directors of your organization or your charity, they all have a duty to, to help sustain the, the, the life of that corporation. And the way you do that is you've got to keep it fiscally sound. You've got to keep it funded. All members of, of the board have that duty. 
And so you can't really have someone on there and say, well, some duties you have, others we, we just ignore. It's just a state statute. It just fiduciary responsibilities and just things that have developed uh, over the years. So, so know what the limitations are. Uh, don't, don't make your law enforcement officers do things that they shouldn't have to do. And uh, the other thing, uh, uh, I don't think that a board member should have to physically deliver a Crime Stoppers reward. And I know everybody has different ways of making payments off, but, but uh, I always fear for, for the people, uh, their, their physical safety, uh, if, if they go out, well, there was one program that had an 89-year-old board member that was going to the park uh, with uh, $4,000 on average once a month to give out money to informants, and that worries me. Uh, nor do you want it to be a uniform police officer uh, who is, is there and, and the, the, the informant fears picking up the reward because uh, they might have a warrant out for their arrest. Uh, they might also think that you got your mugshot book and you're going to look and say, ah, or that you're going to snap a picture. Say, I don't need your tax ID or social security number, but I need to take a picture of you and get your fingerprint so the board will know that I paid you. Well, trust, as Scott was talking about, trust with the informants, uh, it's extremely important. And these people are, are pretty street street smart. Let's talk just a little bit about the media. The media from the very beginning jumped on the Crime Stoppers bandwagon because they thought, especially television, thought this is the hottest thing going. Everybody wants to watch the Crime Stoppers reenactments because they're cool, they're exciting. They say, wow, and to think that really happened down there in the street. You know, that happened, and, and, and they say, and they'll, they'll watch it like every time it came on. Watch it like I was on one, and how foolish! I, I thought this is cool. They they use volunteers, and they even made me sign the waiver that I wrote for the actors. And I was supposed to be a guy walking back from the bus station with a little uh, little uh, suitcase. I get jumped in a field and thrown down and kicked, and they steal my my, my suitcase or briefcase. And and later it was broadcast, and so I said. Man, I didn't know you were such a good actor. Every time they kicked you, man, your face contorted, you were making sounds like that. says, let me tell you, I was not a good actor. That was real. And the guys that were kicking me, they weren't worth a flip as that. They couldn't pull a punch. I was really getting kicked. And the other thing, when they threw me down, I thought that was just you know, weeds or whatever. I thought I was in Vietnam and they were punji sticks. They actually punched through my skin, all these little stalks and everything. So, so don't give me any credit for acting and I'll let somebody else take my place next time. So anyway, but it was so dramatic. Everybody liked to look at it. And then also it was like uh, watching Bowling for Dollars and you were getting a chance to share in the money because if you knew the information, it was the most popular thing. People would call up television stations and say, when is your, uh, uh, your, your Crime Stoppers reenactment going to be shown? I want to watch it again. Some people didn't understand it, and they didn't understand it was a reenactment. They thought it was a live uh, or a, a, a recorded uh, video. And, and we had several people that called in and says, all right, I saw you got me uh, shooting that guy, and I want to turn myself in. <laughs> and, and you, you, you know, you, if they're that stupid, you don't. You say, yes, sir, you can come on in. We'll be waiting for you. And instead of saying, oh, no, we don't know who you are. That was just a reenactment. That wasn't your hand and your glove, and that, that wasn't your gun. You know, that we just got a gun that matched the ballistics. But, you know, there were people. And then, uh, so it, it was wonderful. And, and uh, there were television stations that were fighting with, over the right to be the exclusive broadcaster of Crime Stoppers because they were able to sell broadcasting wrapped around the Crime Stoppers reenactment and they could get more dollars for that. So it, it, was, it was crazy for a while. Then the radio stations learned that they could use sound effects with the script and, and even the newspapers, the print, they got to where they could be pretty creative with everything, and they found that they sold more newspapers uh, at the newsstands on the days that the Crime Stoppers reward offers were publicized, because it's like guys going down buying the newspaper for the racing uh, tip sheets in there before they go to the track. 
Only they had a better chance of making money, some of them did, off the Crime Stoppers reward that was offered than, than on the horse races. So, so it, was, it, was a, it was a hot thing. Uh, and then the, the, the original conferences that we had for training, you, you would ask, okay, how many of you are uh, uh, you know, civilians? Uh, how many of you are law enforcement? How many are news media? And, and a third of the room would be news media. They loved coming to our deals. They'd do stories. And now it is very rare that we have somebody that can go. And, of course, things have transitioned away from the expensive reenactments to the uh, how, 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 how little time can we spend, uh, you know, what, what's the most efficient, effective way to, to communicate the Crime Stoppers Award offer without committing an entire day, day and a half to shooting and editing and, and then have to do it all over again the next week. So now, now things are different, but also we have the Internet, we have the texting. Technology has changed so much in Crime Stoppers. If you think about it, we started with the land-based telephone line and then we were uh, a little bit impressed with uh, uh, with the cordless telephone and then when we went uh, to oh, oh I skipped something right out right about the time of the cordless telephone some of y'all are old enough to remember this some of you maybe some young people or maybe my eyesight can't I can't see you but uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 fax machine. I mean, we knew that the FBI had this deal that when you go tour the, you know, back from the 50s, they had that machine and you'd see it, you know, like it was tracing over a coin or something to like, have a picture of Lincoln or a wheat field or something. Well, they, they could have that kind of uh, thing that was sent electronically. But the fax machine, we thought, oh my God, we can do so much more now with, with crime stoppers and tips and everything. And then we went to the to the wireless telephone and then the, the internet with the web-based tips and, and the, the texting and then, the, then the, uh, the, the progress that we have where now we used to, as I said earlier in the little, little sound bite that I gave for the, the live stream, we, we uh, were, were able to protect it more with law. Now we can almost use the technology to automatically, because because. Uh, Crime Stoppers is not a governmental entity. Uh, we don't have duties to keep certain records uh, as a Crime Stoppers corporation, so long as we provide, uh, uh, keep, keep and maintain the corporation records and the financial records that may be required by the taxing authorities and the authorities that govern corporations in our particular states. Um, so we can decide uh, what to adopt, what rules we have for record retention or record destruction and so forth. And most of the people use a program now that will destroy things that will lead back to the source before it's ever even a legal issue. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, even in uh, uh, the Sunshine Statutes or Public Information Statutes, and by the way, Crime Stoppers is a, is a private uh, charity. It's it's not a governmental entity, therefore it's not subject to open meetings laws. You don't have to let the public come to your meeting because they think you're a, uh, you're a public agency. You don't have to share with them all of the copies of your, your uh, uh, corporation's business. There are very few things that uh, the statutes require you to share if you're, if you're a corporation or a nonprofit. Uh, so, so the way we are created, the way we're put together was for a purpose. The law enforcement has a qualified immunity from liability. Uh, they, in some cases, have a total immunity, a governmental immunity, in, in, in covering some, some topics. The, uh, the, the corporation is protected by the corporate veil. The, the, you act as a board, not as individuals. So if you're not personally and individually liable if you act in the corporate capacity. The corporation is only liable to the extent of its assets. If there's a, a judgment against the corporation and they're a million dollars short, they don't have a duty to keep working and, and earn a million dollars so they can give it to the winning plaintiff in court. They can let that corporation be involuntarily dissolved. The only people that the, the, the only time you're vulnerable as an individual is for one primary area that we've experienced, and that's if you don't pay your federal employment taxes, the IRS can come against your organization, and if they want to, and I'm not trying to scare the board members, they can go against any or all individuals on the board. But 
just make sure that if you have employees, you pay the federal employment taxes, and you don't worry. So what, what Crime Stoppers can become if, if they were to have a catastrophic judgment that was beyond uh, their ability to pay or the, uh, uh, beyond the insurance coverage, they could become Crime Stop Sidestep Incorporated, where you took a little step to the side, renamed, got the same people on there, and there's nothing illegal about that. So uh, the, uh, uh, the, the program was de designed to take advantage of the legal protections already there. For the news media, uh, they are given a qualified, or excuse me, a limited privilege to publicize things without being liable for libel <laughs> or defamation if they reasonably relied upon information supplied to them. And normally the information supplied to them has its source coming from the law enforcement agency or the law enforcement agency via Crime Stoppers. So if it's wrong, all they have to do is say, we were reasonable in relying upon the information we received. Therefore, you can sue us, but you're not going to get anything unless we uh, in intentionally uh, and recklessly uh, publish this information without falling under that limited privilege. So it's the perfect, I don't want to say storm, but it's the perfect beautiful day to operate under with, with Crime Stoppers. And we, we learn from our mistakes and we learn from our successes. I think one of my alarms sort of lit up there a minute ago, so I'm probably pretty close. Was it, uh, do I have something like seven minutes? The, so, something like that. Scott's always here, but I think he only knows the seven minute alert. Uh, am I pretty close to being at 45 and that's when we, we finish? So uh, I've talked a little bit, and, and believe me, I could talk two days on each element of the three three elements, but what, what I will tell you is uh, if I haven't given out my Crime Stoppers uh, email address, I don't think I have it this segment, I'd like to give this to you so that you can contact me. I can tell you that if you're a dues-paid member of Crime Stoppers USA, you can receive unlimited legal assistance. That doesn't mean I'll show up in court and be, become licensed in that state and instantaneously learn all of your laws, but I can help advise your local attorneys on the board or retain to help you or through insurance companies. Uh, if you're a member, otherwise it's pretty general, pretty brief, but my uh, email address is Crime Stoppers Law. Crime Stoppers Law at AOL.com. Crime Stoppers Law at AOL.com. And if you become a dues member, uh, a paid dues member of current of Crime Stoppers USA, they will give you one of my seven telephone numbers and it'll ring and I will know it or feel it and uh, return the call later if I if it's if it's a buzz. So there's so much I can tell you, but I will also tell you that the unofficial history of Crime Stoppers up until about uh, probably 2004 or 5 uh, can also be found on the thumbnail, uh, on the thumb, not the thumbnail, with the thumb drive that you were given, because I think it's under something like History of Crime Stoppers, and, and it. Uh, Name some names, tell you about different developments, when, when the first president, uh, not the first president, but when was the first time a president of the United States recognized and spoke about Crime Stoppers, uh, when the first articles appeared uh, in, in major publications about Crime Stoppers, uh, even certain things about uh, when, when certain people became involved. For example, one of my favorite current TV shows, that, unless it's been canceled, is a person of interest with, I think you pronounce his name, Jim Caviezel or whatever. He's a guy who was Jesus, Jesus got the tar whipped out of him with that whip, and it still makes me cry and, and cuss at the same time. It makes me mad. But anyway, great actor. He got his start doing a Crime Stoppers reenactment. Uh, also, the guy who plays Doogie Howser, and uh, or, uh, Dr. Doogie Howser now plays on some other shows. You know his name, I'm forgetting it right now. Patrick, but Patrick, Patrick Harris. Patrick Harris. Neil Patrick Harris. They have three names, three legged name. Uh, anyway, uh, he got his start doing a Crime Stoppers reenactment. And there's a, a list of other people. So just fascinating knowing uh, uh, what, what uh, we've had. Another thing, and I'll close with this. We were talking in the car when the two Scots and I 
I'm not saying they're both from Scotland, but they're two Scots. Uh, and it wasn't two Scotch as we were drinking. We were, we were riding yesterday in the car. We were talking about John Grisham, the, uh, the author. Uh, John Grisham helped write the first Crime Stopper statute in the state of Mississippi. And, uh, you know, we, we have roots and connections with people that are now so successful and so famous. And there have been people among us uh, where we could almost have a who's who and Crime Stopper. So uh, I didn't do, I don't think I did justice as I know it to the full topic of Crime Stoppers 101, but I, I hope that I gave some of you a little bit of the background, a little bit of some of the principles and the facets that will help you, plus the uh, connections to go back to the thumb drive and find these topics so that you can explore them and look at them at greater length. Uh, I will be here until I finish my address or my presentation tomorrow morning. After that, I will grab my bag and rush like, well, I used to say like O.J. Simpson, but I don't carry a knife. They, uh, and I don't have those gloves or anything. But I rush hurriedly to the airport to make my flight. But uh, during the time that I'm here, I'll be glad to talk with you and help you. And please, uh, uh, you're giving me your attention. You're giving uh, uh, Scott uh, Mills your attention. Uh, please do that for the uh, other speakers because uh, I'm certain that they have things that are equally as important to share with you. And I thank you for inviting me to this, and uh, I wish everybody great success. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Always, always great to have you here, and, and I know people are, are happy to hear you speak and, and give that information. The legal side, the history side, it's, it, it's great to have you. I want to share this, and uh, now, you're going to speak another time now, but you're not going to get a pen each time you speak. <laughs> so we give this, uh, this pen on behalf of Wisconsin State Crime Stoppers for our appreciation in your presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. And, and and we'll just act like he gave it to me because some places they take it back and they give it to me. It reminds me when I was a kid, I got my Easter basket and they didn't make me hunt for the eggs when they gave me the Easter basket. Then we ate Easter lunch and they took it back for another year. And one of those eggs stink if you drop it. Very good. <laughs> With that, we were going to get ready for lunch. <laughs>